last couple years, our team has been working really hard to bring the first augmented reality feature to one of our most loved products, Google Maps. We're still in the midst of this journey, but we thought we'd share some of our learnings with all of you here today to hopefully provide some insight into the process and help you avoid the same mistakes that we made. You know, people often criticize AR as being a hammer without a nail. And it's a fair point. Oftentimes, as I said, about a lot of new technology. However, we on the Maps team saw an opportunity to address one of our longest standing user problems. This scene might look familiar to some of you. You're in an unfamiliar area, maybe exiting a subway, and then you pull up Google Maps to try to figure out which direction to go. And then you just stand there thinking, am I facing this way or this way? And if you're anything like me, you just get really impatient, and then you start walking, only to realize that you've been going the wrong way the entire time. Well, it turns out this is a really common problem, and one that can cause significant stress to some of our users. So we saw an opportunity to introduce a complementary technical approach and combine it with augmented reality to make navigation better for our users. Our vision-based approach works similar to how humans orient and navigate by recognizing familiar features and landmarks. It's a human-like approach to the human scale problem of navigating on foot. Solving this has been one of the most technically challenging projects that I've been a part of during my eight years at Google. And I'm thrilled to be here today with the team to tell you more about how we did it. But rather than walk you through the technology myself, let me introduce Jeremy, our tech lead for localization. Thanks, Joanna. So let's talk about the blue dot. That is that blue dot that shows up in Google Maps to show you where you are in the world and which direction your device is pointed. In augmented reality, robotics, and related domains, oh, we call this process localization. That is, figuring out where something is in space and how it's rotated. And humans have been inventing technology to help us localize and navigate in the real world for millennia. So th think of things like uh, star maps and constellations, or uh, handle compasses, right? Magnets that can point you towards north. Or uh, think about street signs and street maps, or astrolabes and sextants, and other technology for navigating at sea. But in the past few decades, there have been some huge leaps forward in how we can localize ourselves in the world. The global navigation satellite systems, uh, such as GPS, GLONASS, or Galileo, consist of satellites in space that can send signals to a GPS receiver, such as your smartphone, um, that they that allow the device to then calculate the approximate distance to those satellites and triangulate its position in the real world. And this technology often results in very fast and very accurate location information for our devices. Now, of course, for walking navigation, we need a very high level of accuracy. right? We need to be able to tell you uh, which side of the street to be on and when to cross it. And well, where, 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 do, you often, where, where do people walk the most? often in dense urban environments. And so in these urban canyons, we call them right, uh, so streets with big buildings on either side, the signals from these satellites can actually get blocked by the buildings, or in some cases, bounce off of the buildings before they reach your device. And that makes the device miscalculate the distance to the satellites and incorrectly triangulate its position. Now, uh, th these aren't the only difficulties uh, with using this sort of satellite-based uh, GPS approach. Uh, in addition, uh, wh when, you're, when you're calculating distances to satellites, it requires kind of estimating how much time has passed since the signal left the satellite on your, on your smartphone. And uh, timing's already hard enough in software engineering, uh, getting, getting time synchronized across devices. But when you're talking about signals moving at the speed of light, even a nanosecond of error is going to result in you miscalculating by a foot, or a third of a meter for, for the, most of us. Now, <clears throat> that uh, a nanosecond is small enough that even, even a highly accurate atomic clock can drift by a nanosecond once in a while. And I don't know about you, but my smartphone does not have an atomic clock in it. And so uh, you know, I, I, uh, I looked in. So I wanted to see if maybe we could fit 
an atomic clock in there. So if we took a nice uh, $2,000 atomic clock, uh, there are kind of already a lot of components in, that, uh, in, in your average smartphone. And so I think we could fit the atomic clock in there if we uh, just removed the battery. It's a nice trade-off. Now, uh, you know, honestly, I don't think anybody's going to pay for that type of smartphone. Uh, but as long as we're in here, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the components we have in there. There are actually a lot of different things in here that can help with localization. Uh, you see a, an arrow pointing there to the GPS antenna. I'm actually told that, uh, that you can get better reception for your GPS chip if you replace that little antenna there with a paper clip. Now, uh, if any of you are interested, I do have some paper clips and a soldering iron. And if you'd like to void your warranty afterwards, just come talk to me. But don't tell the Pixel team, OK? Now, in addition to the, to the GPS antenna, there's some other ancient hardware, or the newest version of ancient hardware in here. We talked about handheld compasses, right? And so if you've ever used a handheld compass, you know that you have to be careful with it. Uh, when, I, when I've taught kids how to use a handheld compass, they inevitably stand next to a pole, and then the compass points at the pole. Right? A big metal object or anything magnetic can actually throw off the direction of the compass. And so we're going to take one of those handheld compasses, except we're going to shrink it really, really small. And we're going to stick it into your smartphone. And then we're going to surround it with metal components and other circuitry. Then we're going to put a big battery in there. And we're going to run electricity through everything. Now, on a completely unrelated note, that's also how you make an electromagnet. <laughs> so now we have this electromagnet smartphone thing, and we take it into an urban environment, and we surround it with, uh, let's see, subway trains, cars, uh, utility poles, fire hydrants, and all sorts of nice big metal magnetic objects. And we should be surprised that uh, these smartphone compasses can work at all in that type of environment. So we need some more sensors. There are some additional sensors in the smartphone that can help us. Uh, inertial measurement units uh, consist of a set of sensors that can be used to track how the device is well, kind of navigating, how it's moving through space. Uh, things like gyros and accelerometers can tell us how the device is rotating and how its position changes over time. And so your, your smartphone has these. But now, if we're trying to use an accelerometer, to measure how position changes over time, uh, I'll, I'll bet there are a bunch of you out there now thinking that uh, if we have such a small, inexpensive accelerometer, and we're using it to measure acceleration, and it has small errors, those errors will grow to big errors in our positional estimates, especially over longer periods of time. And so this type of inertial odometry that is tracking the movement of something through space using inertial sensors needs additional signals to keep it anchored, to keep it uh, working well over time and keep accurately estimating your position, especially when we have to cram the sensors down so small in this device. We have one more sensor in the device that we haven't talked about, the camera. So we can use the camera in a smartphone to detect visual features in the scene around us. Uh, think like uh, corners of chairs, uh, text on the wall, texture on the floor, and use those to anchor these inertial calculations, right? And, and so that by knowing where, by estimating where those things are, then we can correct for the errors in the inertial sensors over time. And this visual inertial odometry helps make this type of relative tracking, this, this tracking how the device is navigating through space, much more accurate. We can actually take it a step further, though. We can have the device start to memorize these visual features, making it so that the more the device moves around within a given environment, the better it can learn that environment, the better it can map that environment, and the better it can track its own movement within that environment over time. And let's take that a step further. We could actually pre-compute a map using imagery that we've collected around the world, say, from something like Street View. And so we could take all of these visual features from the world, build them up into a pre-computed map, and now use an image from that same camera, match it against the Street View visual features, and precisely position and orient that device 
in the real world. Now, this visual positioning system is the core piece that makes our augmented reality walking navigation experience so fast and accurate. And it achieves a level of accuracy that uh, is much higher than you can achieve with those other sensors that, uh, that we just discussed. Now, the speed and accuracy of localization that you see in this example here is actually pretty typical in that type of environment. And we need localization to be that fast and accurate everywhere you live, work, or travel. So for that reason, we have built out this uh, visual positioning service to work everywhere that we have high quality street view data. That is a lot of countries. Now, this is the result of more than a decade of investment of collecting imagery around the world so that we can build products like this. Now, this map, it, actually, it, it makes me happy and sad at the same time. You can already tell at this zoom level that uh, places like China and most of Africa don't really have any imagery. And it looks okay. other places look OK zoomed out this far. But if you zoom in, you'll notice that coverage can be very sparse in places like India. And that even in, even in uh, places like here, there will be some streets missing here or there. And some of the data is older. Now, uh, lack of imagery, of course, is not the only problem that we encounter when doing uh, camera-based localization. So there are a lot of things that can, that can confuse a, a visual system, uh, things like uh, people, uh, cars, or anything in the environment that changes frequently. And so for trees in particular, we had to do a lot of machine learning and a lot of geometry to help the system learn to ignore things like leaves that change frequently. It's a, you know, visual algorithms love that sort of high frequency feature. And we had to teach it to pay attention to the structure that is more permanent. So things like the building itself and the trunks on the trees. Also, of course, you know, I, uh, I don't know about you, but the last time I got myself hopelessly lost, which was very recent, <laughs> uh, I didn't check to make sure it was going to be light outside first. And th th the core of the problem is that the camera on your smartphone is far less sensitive than the human eye. Your, your human eye is this marvelous thing that does automatic HDR. I mean, it, it, can, it can correct for all sorts of lighting conditions that your, your smartphone camera just cannot handle as easily. And so in a scene that looks reasonable to me where I can navigate fine, all that the smartphone can see is the headlights on the cars. Now, those headlights are generally moving, which means that AR Core can't successfully latch onto any visual features in order to tell how it's, the device moved through space. And none of the permanent structure is actually visible to the camera, meaning there is nothing for us to match against from Street View. Now, even in the middle image, as, as you start to get more light in the scene and you start to be able to see more of the structure, it's still, it's still not, it looks so different from what it looked like when the Street View car drove by a year before that we have, it, it, it's very confusing still to the visual system and it usually still won't work. Now, as the light increases a bit more or in very well-lit areas, think like uh, certain streets in New York, which are well-lit all the time, uh, then the system can start to work more often, but it's really not something that you can rely on in low light. Now, I already showed you how packed in everything is in a smartphone. But the battery takes up a lot of space. And, and that's for a good reason. We don't want it to run out. Now, if you've ever built an app that uh, uses the GPS a lot, that leaves it on for long periods of time, you may have noticed that that can run down the battery. Uh, but the cost of using the GPS chip or any of these other localization sensors uh, pales in comparison to the cost of using that camera. So turning on the camera and putting that image on the screen of the device is a, is a significant power draw. Uh, and so just opening up your camera app already uses up a lot of power and isn't something that you can do for your entire two or three kilometer walk. And so um, 
at least not if, not if you want to have your, your uh, phone last till the end of the day. Now, uh, we, we looked into different approaches for handling this. And uh, our first idea was just we need to make everybody carry around an extra battery all the time. And we thought all we got to do is make it socially cool to carry around a battery all the time. And so we experimented with this. I took a battery out. I plugged my phone into it with a USB cable through the pocket and uh, walked around trying to use walking nav to see how people reacted and see if anybody you know, started adopting it. Um, they did not. Um, and I felt pretty silly walking around like that with my phone plugged into my pocket. Uh, in addition, of course, just having that extra power going in from the battery in my pocket made the compass performance even worse. So you know, I, uh, my next idea was that I was going to go get a map of Mountain View printed on the back of my phone so that whenever the battery dies, I still won't be lost. Uh, but when it came down to it, we really realized that we have to make some trade-offs here. Just like any of your location-based apps have to be careful about when they uh, not having the GPS on all day, we do the same thing with the camera. We want to have the camera on when it's essential to have highly precise localization. And so when you want to know exactly where to go and which turn to take, then we have the camera on, and we can localize you with very high quality. But once you are on your way and know where you're supposed to be going, then the camera turns off, and we rely on the other sensors to localize the device and keep you along your path. Of course, you, we've got to keep you along the right path. Uh, walking directions have to be quite a bit different than driving directions. Uh, during, during driving, remember, we have, to keep you, uh, we have to keep you on a fast route. So we have to take into account speed limits and traffic. Uh, we want to tell you where to make the right turns, legal turns. And uh, we want to tell you which lane of traffic you should be in when you make that turn. Whereas in walking navigation, uh, it's very rare that I exceed the speed limit. Um, and I need to know which side of the street I should be on and whether or not there's a sidewalk there. I need to know where the crosswalks are that I can cross safely on. And not all walking paths are right next to a road. Uh, many, many of them are actually on a trail or in a park. And often there are very convenient pedestrian overpasses and underpasses. And all of these mechanisms can, all of these uh, different way, types of paths can actually be the best and most scenic and safest ways to complete your walking journey. And so we need to take all of these into account. Now, we get a lot of the data about where these are from, uh, from other providers. But for much of it, we have to use all of this imagery we've collected. So street view data and aerial data from planes and satellites. And then using a combination of manual labeling and machine learning, uh, we find all of these features that we can automatically to be able to surface them in the map and give you the best way to get from point A to point B. All right, so we've talked about some of the difficulty and some of the technology that we've built to make it so that we can accurately localize you at point A and then direct you along a good route to point B. But this, this core technology, this, this navigation technology, uh, doesn't really do any good without being able to be presented to the user in the right way. Now remember, these, like, when, when we're using this, we are walking down a busy street, and we need to get there safely, and we want our smartphone to surface the right information in the way we need it. And that is hard, no matter how good the underlying localization and map are. And so our user experience team has done a lot of iteration on this, and Rachel here, is, who, is, who leads that team, is going to tell us all about it. Thanks, Jeremy. So if developing a new technical approach using VPS plus Street View plus ML wasn't complex enough, we also had to dive into a totally new area of interaction design, designing for outdoor world scale AR experiences. So what does it mean to reinvent walking navigation for people around the globe? Well, first, we have to understand how people navigate in a variety of contexts, city layouts, and city densities. Just like Jeremy and his team have to understand all the technical factors for scaling globally, we have to make sure we take all those different contexts into account. 
Most people don't realize it, but cities across the globe are laid out really differently, and these different layouts deeply affect the way that people navigate on foot within them. In New York City, for example, it's pretty easy to understand where you are at any given time, especially above 14th Street, because it's all laid out on a grid and you can just follow the numbers as you go up. But in Tokyo, you don't always see street signs, most people use landmarks to navigate, and things are so dense that that restaurant you're trying to get to might be inside a building on the eighth floor and only accessible through the rear elevator. When starting this project, we also wanted to investigate the types of questions that people are asking as they navigate on foot around the world. Which way should I start walking? And is this my turn, or is it one more block up? Where exactly is my destination? And these questions are coming up because GPS and Compass aren't cutting it, but also through user research, we found that many people struggle with map abstraction. For lots of folks, it's hard and sometimes even anxiety-inducing to quickly understand the relationship between what they're seeing in the real world with what's on the 2D map. Well, turns out one of the strengths of AR is allowing us to believably place things in the real world, just like you might put your favorite pink alligator on your dining room table. So we thought, what if we took that strength of AR and combined it with a new technical approach that Jeremy described? Could we solve the which way do I start walking problem, but maybe also the abstraction issue? Well, that sounds simple enough, right? All we have to do is put a blue line on the ground, same as the one that we have in the 2D map, right? Well, not quite. This is an early design exploration where we tried exactly that. The trouble with this approach is that putting a precise looking line on the ground doesn't flex well with varying levels of localization or data quality. Plus, in user testing, we found that people feel compelled to walk right on that AR blue line. So that's not good. We needed to find a solution that would strike the right balance between providing the specificity and clarity users were looking for, but also flex well with those varying levels of localization and data quality. So we did a lot of explorations. Over 120 prototype variants, in fact. And the thing is, we had to do this. There's no material design spec site that the team and I can pull up to, <laughs> to understand how to design for outdoor world-scale AR. We've literally been uncovering these best practices throughout this project. And it wouldn't have been possible without the ability to iterate quickly and test with people on a weekly basis. So I wanted to walk you through a few examples of how the experience evolved throughout this project. But first, there might be a prototype up here that looks familiar to you. Maybe a furry friend that made an appearance at I.O. last year. A fox. The, jo <laughs> Joanna knows. OK, all right, I might as well address the fox in the room. So at I.O. last year, we showed how AR walking navigation could provide a lot of user value in Google Maps. We also showed this friendly navigating fox over the past year, we've done over 25 prototype variants and tested them with people of the Fox experience. We've found that it is really hard to get the experience right between a helpful AR character and a person. People expect her to be a lot smarter than she really is. Imbuing her with intelligence, they expect her to know shortcuts, to avoid poles, to avoid fire hydrants. Some people even expect her to lead them to interesting things to do in the city. <laughs> I wish. Uh, plus, people are enamored by her. I mean, how could you not be? She's adorable. But with all these expectations put on an AR character, it becomes even harder to get the interaction right. So rest assured, we're continuing to prototype and test the Fox experience, but we want to make sure that we're providing a delightful experience, but also being helpful in the moments that matter. All right, so back to walking you through a few examples of how the experience evolved throughout the course of this project. When working on the localization experience, we needed to understand how long it would take to get the user effectively localized, lo effectively localized and how we needed them to look around at the environment. So at the beginning of this project, I remember coming to Jeremy over here and asking him, you know, how long do we think it's going to take the user to get localized? And I remember you said something like 10 seconds. So like 10 seconds is a lot. OK, what can we do <laughs> with that time? Um, so we developed this particular approach where we're having the user fill in these 3D shapes as they look around. 
So that was okay, uh, but a few months passed and our localization technology was getting better and better. It wasn't taking 10 seconds anymore. In fact, in some cases it was taking less than one second. So we decided to go back to the drawing board on this particular interaction. And we developed what you see here in the experience. We're simply asking users to point their phones at buildings and signs across the street, Think, something that we know often yields quick localization. We have a little bit of a moment of confirmation when we get that good localization, but it's pretty straightforward. When working on the path visualization, we were really excited about this particular direction. The idea was that the user would be able to follow the stream, the stream of uh, 3D particles all the way to their destination. It was going to be great. The stream of particles would be able to flex in width, depending on if we had good localization or good data quality, providing specificity when we had it and vagueness when we didn't have it. We were super excited to test this with users. So user testing came around, put it in front of people, and people hated it. Um, the whole reason they wanted to use AR in the first place was for that specificity and clarity, not to be shown some weird, vague path of particles. Plus, the motion was distracting. Oh, and people didn't think that these particles were lovely and ethereal like we did. They literally described them as trash. <laughs> So, so not wanting our users to follow trash, we kept iterating. In a design sprint, we started to gravitate around this particular direction. The idea was that we could show a little bit of the 2D map in combination with the AR view. The thinking being that for many people, using AR walking navigation and maps will be the ver their very first time using any sort of AR experience. So providing some familiar elements can actually be really helpful. It might be the case that one day we take out the 2D map at the bottom, but for now, it provides a really good gut check. Um, our journey uh, with AR walking navigation in Google Maps is nowhere near done, but we have learned a few things that we think will be helpful for anyone who might be thinking about designing an outdoor world scale AR experience. This is by no means meant to be a comprehensive or definitive list, but merely a starting point. We know that as we roll out to more people, we'll learn more and we'll revisit these principles. I'm just not going to move from this spot. OK, uh, we'll, we'll learn more and we'll revisit these principles. Um, but we wanted to give you a peek into what we're thinking so far. So the first principle is to embrace the sense of immediacy. What do we mean by that? Well, when your AR environment includes nearby buildings, buildings in the distance, streets, sidewalks, and more, it can be really hard to manage the user's attention, especially through this narrow field of view of the smartphone, while also communicating how far away something is. You're much better off focusing the user's attention on one thing at a time and highlighting that focus area. You also want to consider how you're uh, representing things that are occluded to make it even clearer what's near versus far, visible versus not. All right, the next principle is to provide grounding and glanceability. When doing those 120 plus prototype variants, we began to realize that we needed to strike a certain visual balance to be most helpful. Uh, the AR objects needed to simultaneously stand out from their surroundings, but also be placed in a particular location to provide maximum clarity to users. So show me exactly where that turn is, but stand out from the real world. This balance of providing grounding but also glanceability might be a little bit different than what you're used to seeing in other AR applications, where the whole idea is to blend into the environment, like how you might want to try out that AR lamp in your living room before you buy it, or how you want that realistic dragon to look like it's really flying in front of your friend. But for outdoor world-scale AR experiences specifically focused on utility rather than entertainment, it's important to be both grounded and glanceable. All right, the third principle is to leverage the familiar. Google Maps has long been a 2D experience focused on navigation and discovery. AR now makes up a very small percentage of that experience. The familiar that we're referring to in this principle is all the representations in the 2D UI that users have become used to over the years. Things like the fact that we use a red pin to represent the destination, or a blue callout for upcoming turns. If we had reinvented how we presented information in AR and come up with a new visual metaphor, 
people would have, have, would have had to have gotten used to that new visual metaphor in addition to getting used to the whole interaction patterns with AR. And that would have been a lot to ask of people. All right, so our last principle is one that extends beyond UX design and has important but practical product implications. So I'm going to pass it back to Joanna, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about our last and arguably most important principle. Thanks, Rachel. So as Rachel just showed, crafting this experience required considerations that go far beyond the traditional 2D or web application. And it introduced a lot of new and complex questions. When we first started this project, we all envisioned an AR mode where a user would both start and end their journey all while using the camera. But as we continued to develop, we realized that this was actually a really bad idea. For starters, People have a lot of trouble paying attention to their surroundings if they're only looking at the world through this small screen. In fact, people are often overconfident in this regard because they think that by having the camera view, it actually erases the negative effects of looking at your phone. But that's definitely not the case. So we needed to build in safeguards to effectively prevent people from walking into a pole or worse, the street. We did a lot of experimentation to try to see what would work best for this type of problem. In the beginning, we actually just tried punting them back to the 2D map once they started walking. But it actually made them think that the AR feature was broken. We also tried a pop-up message, like you might see in some other applications. But they, complained that it, but they said that they found it obtrusive and annoying. We also tried blurring the screen based on the amount of time that they had been in AR. But that didn't really work either. Our current solution looks like this. If a user starts walking while using AR, we'll first ask really nicely to pay attention by using a subtle message at the top. If they continue, we'll be a bit more insistent with a full screen overlay that effectively prevents them from continuing to use AR. The feedback has admittedly been mixed, with some people who find it too, still too obtrusive, uh, while others express gratitude for the reminder to actually pay it pay better attention. We know that we won't please everyone, but it was really important to us to try to build in the right affordances to nudge people to be safe and ultimately just enjoy more of the world around them. We think that this design is a, right, a step in the right direction, but if it's not, we'll start again from scratch. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our experience is not only helpful, but also responsibly designed. As you think about creating your own world-scale AR experiences, we highly encourage you to think about all the different environments a user might find themselves in and help build in those right affordances to make sure that they're using the experience in the most responsible way. Encouraging momentary uses of AR versus one long continuous path also helps with battery usage. So as Jeremy mentioned, using the camera is really expensive. But on the flip side, using the camera more often actually results often in better tracking and faster relocalization. Truly solving this particular problem requires hardware innovations that will take some time to be realized. But what we can do as product, and product teams and developers is encourage user and interaction patterns that help mitigate these efforts. Therefore, the last principle that we wanted to emphasize is keep AR moments short and assistive. You know, in some of these earlier builds, we actually presented all of the information that you might find on a 2D Google Maps view in the AR view, things like time and distance to destination. And while that information is undoubtedly useful, we realized that it was actually encouraging people to stay in AR for longer periods of time than they actually needed. We basically want to encourage people to just use it for when they want those glanceable, that, that visual information, and then for everything else, send them back to the 2D map or encourage them to put their phones away. They don't really need AR just to know that they need to walk five minutes, in the, in the five minutes straight, right? So just to summarize, here are the four principles that we talked about today. One, embrace the sense of immediacy. Two, provide grounding and glanceability. Three, leverage the familiar. And four, keep AR moments short and assistive. It's definitely not a comprehensive list, but they're all things that we had to learn the hard way. So we hope that you enjoy them, because we had to fail a lot of times to actually <laughs> get to this. All right, so we talked a lot today about why it's so hard and challenging to make this experience work well everywhere. 
But now I want to talk a little bit about how we're balancing getting that real world feedback needed to actually improve the experience with making sure that it's robust enough to add value. Normally at Google, we dog food all of our products, meaning we basically have Google just test and use it and provide feedback. However, we don't have Google offices in all of the areas that we have Street View. Also, the world changes really rapidly, like Jeremy was talking about before, and it's just not scalable to continuously collect Street View on a monthly basis all over the world. Getting this experience and the underlying technology right requires real world testing by a diverse set of users in all the locations we hope to launch it in. But we also didn't want to roll it out too quickly and see the headline Google Maps launches useless AR feature. So that's why earlier this year, we actually you, we actually enlisted our most ardent Google Maps fans, local guides. Any local guides in the audience here today? Yay. Nice. <laughs> so we're really lucky to have a community of Google Maps fans who are willing to take some of our most, most nascent experiences and test them out in the real world and provide really valuable feedback to us. Over the last several months, we've had local guides all around the world tell us how AR was able to help them figure out which way to go when they're exiting the tube in London or uh, explore a rural area of Sri Lanka, or find that nondescript office building in Ghana. At the same time, they've also told us how we've missed opportunities to route them on walking pads, how it can use a lot of battery, and how sometimes those bright, big 3D arrows scare them when they pop up too suddenly. So we clearly have a lot of work to do, but we're really thankful to have this community of users stick by us as we try to improve and create the future of Maps. All right, so what's next? We know that walking is not confined to daytime, as convenient as that would make our jobs. And so we're exploring new ways where we can assess, assist users better at night. It's a really hard computer vision problem, but one that we're really motivated to try to solve. We also want to expand Street View coverage so that we can enable this experience in more areas across the world. And ultimately, we know that we need to get better at localizing users faster and more reliably. But like I said earlier, improving this experience requires knowing when and where we fail to be useful, and then investigating the causes why. That's why yesterday we were really excited to announce that we'll actually be expanding the experience to all Pixel users. <laughs> Our goal is to expand this experience as widely as possible. But we want to balance that with making sure that we're adding value and making a good first impression. So we'll be working with both our local guides community and Pixel users to make sure that we're continuing to shape and improve this experience. Thank you so much for coming to our talk today. I can't wait to see what all of you guys build. And if you have any questions, we'll just be off to the side of the stage and are happy to chat. Thanks.